This is Metrosource Minis, the official podcast of Metrosource Magazine and home of short-form interviews with your favorite personalities from the LGBTQ world and beyond. Quick, fun, and informative, it's Metrosource on the go. Out and proud since 1990. Well, hello, hello, hello. This is Metrosource Minis. I'm your host, Alexander Rodriguez. Well, what I do in the shadows is not very family friendly or COVID friendly, but I am talking with someone who is out of the shadows and into Hollywood spotlight. Glad award winning actor and producer Harvey Ginn's inventive and creative approach to acting has won the hearts of fans across the globe in the hilarious FX Emmy nominated comedy series, What We Do in the Shadows. In addition to that, um, he'll be seeing the upcoming film, Werewolves Within, based on the Ubisoft game of that same name. He has been in everything, TV series and films, including sci-fi's The Magician, and Nickelodeon's The Thundermans in Spandex, uh, Apple TV's Little America, MTV's Eye Candy. He's also uh, portrayed Elijah in the Don't Ask, Don't Tell Me What to Do episode of the series Raising Hope, uh, which he received the Glad Media Award nomination or award for that role. Um, and he also acted uh, opposite my boyfriends, Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn, in the internship and in Netflix's mystery thriller. And you have to to watch, by the way, this Halloween season, uh, Truth or Dare. Also find him in the final season of another favorite show of mine, Room 104. Uh, there's foam and there's like long punk hair involved. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Also on Quibi's Don't Look Deeper. And coming soon, uh, we're gonna see him, uh, you know, sing and dance in Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Actually, he's filming that right now. So he is, uh, he's talking with us on his day off in Canada from set. Please welcome Harvey Guillen. Hi. <laughs> You're like my new publicist. I love that intro. I was like, oh, that's right. I totally forgot about. Yeah. Okay. I was like, you, you, you're hired. It's like, well, I mean, you have been a busy, busy man. Um, and it's funny when you look at it, it's like, wow, there's so much. And from the explosion point of it, you know, being uh, Emmy nominated, part of an Emmy nominated cast. Um, I mean, everything is just coming at you left and right. Um, and so it, it must be quite a moment for you to kind of look back and and think, you know what, this I, I've 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 done my job and I have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny, like it's like when people say, you know, overnight success, and it's like, oh, you don't see like the work that people put into like that's exactly right. You know, making it look simple and making it look easy is probably the hardest job, you know, because people are like, oh, that guy out of nowhere. And it's like, well, yeah. it's like, mm. but. It's nice to go down, you know, uh, the IMDb credits of like the things that I was like, oh, that's right. It's like everything's just a stepping stone for the next thing. And and what a great, you know, year, even though during this craziness, I was just, you know, I was just telling you that I was just like so honored and like privileged to be working during this like, you know, pandemic and doing it safely and the way things are going to be done from now on. And I'm on set right now in Vancouver filming Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Uh, with a great story arc and I get to sing and dance and all that jazz and I'm super excited and we're doing it safely and it's like, trust me, we're doing it safely. It's like the protocols are so meticulous and insane, but they need to be there. So, yeah. Now, as an actor, what happened when you when you got that call saying, hey, we're, we're coming back to work. Uh, we need you on set. I mean, what was your first reaction? Because I, I know you're a little terrified of, of, of COVID. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's a little terrified. <laughs> yeah, well, we should be. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, there was like there was like talks about going back to uh, film uh, other projects, and and the time wasn't right, like you know, uh, with scheduling. And I was um, offered to do a film in New Zealand, which would have been perfect as well because they had zero cases, and. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the scheduling w wouldn't allow it because then it interfered with uh, Shadows and also I got an offer to do Zoe's um, and I was like the only one I could really do in between Shadows and 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 then uh, would be Zoe. So I had this like time of bubble and it was like two months and it was like, okay, I can totally do it and then be done and then go home for like, you know, Christmas and then start production with Shadows. It would have been the perfect, uh, you know, uh, segue. So that was the only reason that that kind of came to be. But after a year of like, you know, I have so many actor friends who it's been tough, you know, it's been tough for everyone. Like it's like the yeah. arts are like just getting back on, you know, 
track and there's i think there's 62 productions in vancouver right now and like they call vancouver hollywood north because yeah. literally it's like they were the one of the first cities to be like come film here you know as we're long as you're doing it safely and canada is doing it safely and they have things under control so i feel i see the difference i feel like being here in canada and seeing the things are running the way things are running here and the way things are running in america i was like oh that's what we're not doing oh Oh, and we also are not taking it serious. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, you know, and it helps to have uh, a leader with a brain, but that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, <laughs> like a leader that stands behind like science or like you know facts or you know help. Oh, that. Oh, that. Now, as, a, as an actor, you know, having to prepare for for a day of filming, you know, you're in hair, you're in makeup, you're you're worrying about the script, you're thinking about the hours of head. And then now we have all of this protocol and I've seen some of your social media posts and I've seen other actors and there's just so much protocol from, from the cleanliness, from the testing to the wearing the face mask in between um, takes and, and you know, even in, in, the, in the makeup room. How does that play with your psyche as an actor? I mean, how can you mentally prepare and really get into character with all of this going on? It's just a different layer. You know, it's just that uh, you prepare, the first day was a little, you know, uh, jarring. It was just like, this is happening. You know, you have to wear like a plastic shield from your trailer to makeup. And once you get to makeup, you can take it off. And uh, everyone in the makeup show, there's no more than like, you know, the two artists and the two uh, makeup or hair specialists there. Uh, it's spaced out. Uh, they're wearing full on mask and full on body suits. And it's weird. It's weird to be like, you know, cause usually you're in the makeup and hair chair and you're getting ready for the day and you're going over your lines and you're falling to the character. And this time around, you're looking in the mirror and just like, like the person's putting makeup on you, it looks like you're a science experiment. You know, they're wearing gloves and they're like, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're like catching, you know, like, are my bags that bad today? And they're like, <laughs> and I was like, I eat what? And she's like, <laughs> and, she's like and I'm just like, oh man, this is so weird. But it's also, we're trying to be safe as possible. And, and if we're gonna get entertainment, because let's not forget the first thing people ran to during a pandemic was entertainment to you know uh to escape and right now that's actually a big thing that's happening where like that's the first thing to go uh in public schools it's like the arts are the last thing to be funded uh, and the first thing to be cut you know uh and so that's a reminder to like don't forget about the arts like let's keep supporting the arts because remember who was there for you when <laughs> you were at home yeah. for four months and needed distraction uh, artists. And so, uh, but yeah, it's like a new way of doing things. And it's like, it does take a second to fall into it, but luckily for, you know, it's a musical here. So uh, it's usually very cheery, very fun. And uh, I just can't imagine doing like a drama right now. Like I'd be like, oh, that's really heavy. <laughs> like it's just like a drama. I and <laughs> like I wouldn't want to carry that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but poor Mel Streep is probably somewhere crying her eyes out, you know, behind a face mask. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, with the explosion of, of what we do in the shadows, you have given so many interviews. And what I love about you is, you know, you've done everything from like Entertainment Tonight. You've also done like a podcast run by someone's grandma in Kansas. Like you, you love talking about your craft and your character so much. Um, and you still maintain what I call, and I called it in in your in your um, interview in Metrosaurus, like that all shucks attitude, like ah, oh, you know. <laughs> Do you think that you have maintained that kind of energy and that willingness to really kind of chat with everybody uh, because you work so hard to get where you've been? I mean, you literally went through trash cans looking for recycled, you know, bottles to pay for your acting career. I mean, that's that's literally the passion that you had to get in this industry. Yeah, I just feel like, you know, um, talking about the podcast where someone reached out to me and said that uh, their mom um, was a cancer survivor and um, and they were at a stage where, you know, they always wanted to do things off their bucket list. And one of the things off their bucket list was to have a show to talk to celebrities. So they just started the show, uh, her daughter and and, and, uh, and her mother, they just did like a duo thing and they reached out to me through social media and said, hey, I know this is a long shot, but what do you want to do? I was like, yes, because she told me the yeah. story. I was like, that's incredible. And it's like, yes. And it's that's like her, you know, bucket list. Like, it's like, why would I, like, why wouldn't I? Like, it's like, I'm just honored to be on that list, you know? So it was like, literally you're on, his, on her list to people to interview and I said, yeah, let's do it because, you know, everyone's going through something, you know, when you walk down the street and when we were able to walk down the street, you just don't know. And it's just like, you don't know what people's journeys are, where they're headed, like what their day's like. And if you can make someone's day just better by just showing up or just like, you know, you know, spending two minutes, why not? Like, what's that? Like not no skin off your back, you know, that's my mentality. And I think it comes from my work ethic that 
you know, my parents uh, kind of, uh, put in me they just like literally like you know work hard and the reward is you know what comes after you work hard and so just keep working hard and 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 you're bound to succeed because you can never look back and say i didn't succeed because i didn't try you know you know if something yeah. goes wrong it has nothing to do with you trying like just keep going <laughs> um and now when people are interviewing you you know it's it's so easy to focus on easy labels especially when you're doing like a quick 10 minute interview and some of the labels that they focus on you know be you being part of the latinx community uh being body positive being part of the gay community do you ever get what i call uh i call it activist fatigue where it's like you know this is what we have to talk about time after time and it's like can we do you ever get can to the point where can we just focus on me and my acting do you ever get that activist fatigue no, I don't because there's always something to fight for, you know, like even even the sweater I'm wearing now, like this familiar sweater. It's like, you know, part, uh, part I of ordered it. <laughs> you did. Thank you. I it's did. part of the process of going to the self-evident project, which is an organization that helps, um, you know, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus youth during this COVID pandemic, you know, help them with essentials, people who've lost, you know, uh, finance, jobs, anything. And so I, why wouldn't I? Attach myself to like this project, you know, Topher, the designer and I like put this together. We can go to uh, I'm a foolish mortal.com. He has amazing uh, projects and art pieces. And we created this together and said, why wouldn't I use my platform to help someone? Why wouldn't I use my platform to help uh, queer kids, you know, in need during COVID and during pandemic? So there's always something to like, you know, you put your name on to help. Like it's never like my work is going to speak for itself. So we don't really need to talk about it. Like if I need to focus and I need you to give me feedback on my work and that I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. Like this is just, you know, trying to be shallow or like trying to be self-absorbed. So if you can talk about that and also something that we're passionate about, then that's the goal. Like if it's like, and also let's help out, you know, and let's change this and let's support the art. And, but why wouldn't I, you know, so I never get tired and I never like, can we get back to talking about me? Because <laughs> if I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, the longevity of this profession, if I'm going to be here for a while, like it's like, it's always going to be something to talk about of your work. You're always going to be, you know, your work is going to speak for itself and we'll let people like want to talk about it and, and, and they can do that. And you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea or you're going to be someone's favorite. And that's not your job. Your job is to just do the best you can in your craft and then put it out there. And then if they, it's well received, it's well received. But while I'm here, I like to mention, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. You are so adorable. <laughs> Let's talk about the success of what we do in the shadows. The, sh the show is a mix of like The Office, Waiting for Guffman and Adam's Family, which I totally love. When the show first came out based on the film, I... I was ecstatic and, you know, seeing the first episode, it's like, I love this. This is my sense of humor. It's dark. It's, it's um, subtle humor. Um, and it's just so rich and the characters are, are so rich, but I never in my wildest imagination would have thought it would have been such a mainstream hit. Um, at what point did you guys kind of realize, Hey, you know, this, this is a really, really good show. Um, was there that moment that it kind of clicked for everybody that, yeah, th this has got some teeth on it. Yeah, I think it was for me, it was the pilot. We were shooting the pilot and, uh, you know, everyone was cast in the show except for Guillermo at the last minute. Um, I kind of swooped in and got the audition by accident. Like I, I, I don't know if I told you the story before, but I went to Wine and Cheese Night and I yeah. met someone at that party. Yeah, and they got me an audition and I was the last person to be cast. I got the call straight from Tyke and Jermaine on like a Sunday, Martin Luther King weekend. It was that Monday. So nothing happened Monday. Tuesday was a fitting and Wednesday I was on set. I never had a wow. chemistry with Kayvon. And that was what I was fearing the most because I was like, what if this person I meet, I don't have any connection with and they're supposed to have, you know, 10 years of history. And in the script, the original script, the uh, Guillermo had been working for 20 years. So he was older than I was. So I wasn't even right for the part. So it goes to show that you can go in for something you're not right for and still, you know, make it your own. Uh, but I was just worried about that. And then I met Kayvon and within seconds of meeting him and I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. Like I just knew because it just an instant rapport with him. And it was like, you know, if you see their, their chemistry on set with Guillermo and Nandor, like it's something that just flows and like bounces off each other very nicely. And, and you can't teach that or you can't, you know, force yeah. that on someone. Like it just, it's there or it's not. And so when I knew that, and then of course, watching everyone else do their scenes, like, you know, Matt and Natasha and Mark, and we're a small cast, we're only five actors yeah. in the cast, but everyone is amazing at what they do. So then when I saw that, it was like one of those rare moments when you're like, oh, everyone's bringing it. Like everyone here is bringing their A game. And I just, I just had this like feeling of, and I had this feeling of like, cause you know, with pilots, sometimes they don't get picked up and it's just a pilot. So I had this feeling of like, 
it's, I hope it gets picked up. But if it doesn't, I can walk away from this pilot saying like, that was a mistake on whoever didn't pick it up because this, <laughs> this work was amazing. And sometimes, you know, you have pilots that you're like, fingers crossed because you know that it's not like everything's falling into place as much as you want it to be. You can, you're only responsible for your own work, you know? So I'm responsible for myself. But then when you see the overall product, you're like, oh, it didn't like all like blend well or like the pieces didn't fall in place. And so you're like, fingers crossed they pick it up. And then with this one, I was like, no, there's, it's, this is special. Like this is really special. And here we are going to season three. Well, and it's funny you say that because most uh, great long lasting shows have terrible pilots. You look at the pilot for Seinfeld, Will and Grace, uh, you know, some of those shows and it's like, oh, even Golden Girls, the show was so different. You guys nailed it, like you said, right on the first episode and it fits so seamlessly with the rest of the show. Um, you know, I, I was enchanted from the first moment. And you talking about black and white on paper, you were not exactly the 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 best fit for Guillermo. And your whole career is kind of peppered with successful roles that you have taken on that uh, in theory were just not the perfect fit for you. What is your secret to booking these roles? And how do you walk <laughs> into an audition knowing that you're not the perfect match for the character, but you do it anyway? Yeah, I mean, I mean, going back to the whole pilot thing. Um, yeah, it's like going in. It's like rare where like the, the character is just you are just there. Like when you walked into set, all of us had you know the first season is usually the season where you try to find the characters and like people. I mean, you watch like episodes like you know the first episode of Will and Grace. Like even yeah. Karen changes a little bit, yep. like her yep. yeah, way she played. And so people are trying to find what these characters. They know there's something there, but they're finding them. And I think with us, you know, we we're really close to finding, like the characters are really there. Like, so when you saw this together, we're like, I believe it. Like I'm in, like I'm 150% in. And we had the that luxury that everyone came in and they did a really great job of casting and everyone is like the perfect person for that role. And I know because it took months and months and months to find all those characters. And when they did, they it was perfect. And so we had the luxury of having a great pilot and then taking that first season to really kind of like, dig in and peel away at the onion, you know, of these characters. And I think for me going to auditions, I go into the audition hoping that I get the job, but always wanting to book the room. Like that is my goal always. So I always go with the intention of like, it'd be great to have this job. Of course, that's where you're showing up. Everybody wants a job. You're not going to an audition. I'm always surprised when actors half-ass an audition. I was like, yeah, it's all right. And I was like, why would you eh, half-ass yeah. your audition? Because that that alone is a, that's your legacy. When you leave that room, you're like, it's okay. I didn't get it, but I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even memorize the lines. Or I didn't even like, and I was like, that is not good. Why would you show up? not 150% because that, that that's what they'll remember, you know? And sure enough, it's like, that's that's been my mentality. I always go in with hoping to get the job, but to booking the room. Like I wanna book the room. And if the casting director uh, likes you, if you did a great job and they can't use you in this, they will bring you back. They will always exactly bring you right. back. I've always had casting directors who, you know, want me to come in for something else, even though I'm not right. Like the when I went in for, you know, the internship, it was, the role was not for me at all. Like it was not written at all for me. It was not description and, and height and like and everything. And I just went in, I was like, I'm going to do this character the way I think he would do. And, you know, and Sean, the director and creator was on the floor laughing. And then two weeks later, he wrote the character that I got to play. And that's happened several times. Like, you know, on Thundermans, like I went in and yeah, I love Thundermans. Like they didn't want me to do it. My agents were like, it's two lines, it's beneath you. And I was like, I collected cans out of trash can. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I don't think two lines uh, is the hill I die on, you know? And so I was yeah. like, well, tell me about the character. And they're like, oh, he's family. They're at a funeral, he's family. I was like, and he's a superhero? I've never been a superhero. No one gives me the chance to play a superhero in this business. And I was like, uh, and you get to wear tights? Yeah, sign me up. Um, so it was one of those moments where, like I went into it with two lines and then I got to set and they let me improvise. They added more lines. And then four weeks later, they wrote a whole episode for him. And then I recurred on that show for four seasons. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. that in itself is insane. And it just shows you, uh, like you said, what, what the power of an actor can have commanding the room. That's your few minutes where you have the room and all eyes are on you and you never know where it's going to end up. And I, I know your role on Nickelodeon was such a great image for kids to see is like, you know, there's no way that a superhero has to look a certain way. You know, now we're talking about progressive casting um, with, with different ethnicities as different superheroes. And we're having that narrative. It's like, yeah, we can strip away all of the ideas that we were taught, even on Broadway shows. You know, we have gender swapping. We have different um, 
ethnicities playing these lead roles that have been white all along. And it's so great to see this energy. Um, and, and you're part of that legacy. Okay, so you are filming Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. And I know that you are a musical theater kid. So being able to incorporate your musical, uh, you know, background into this must be must be so thrilling. Um, tell me how this rehearsal process has been different for you in terms of TV and film, kind of going back to your musical theater roots. It's uh, it's definitely different because you know, again, it's a musical, and our choreographer Mandy Moore, who just won you know the Emmy for choreography yes. for this show is amazing like it's like it really brings me back to my musical theater days as a kid because i haven't done musicals since then since i was in school really and like shortly after school i did a little bit but not really and not definitely not for tv or film so this is kind of a nice treat and um austin the creator was you know super excited we talked about the character when he offered me the role and it was just like this is a great arc for this character and also the songs that he gets to sing and uh, it was just nice. And also going to rehearsals, it's very much like going to rehearsals like you did when you were musicals. You have dance rehearsal at 9 a.m. You have to uh, vocal training at like 11 to go over your music. And then you have recording session in the afternoon and back to dancing and blocking on the set. And you have to wear your dance shoe. Like, you know, it's like the stuff that you did in high school and in college where you were like, oh, God, because it took like, you know, four months to put a musical up. But the difference yeah. is we had four days, you know? Yeah. So it's like <laughs> the difference is like four months before when you were like, oh, God, I can't wait till this opens in the spring and you're talking in October, right. you know? Yeah. You're like you're rehearsing all these months for what? For like three days of performance, you your family would come like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> and, then exactly you get all right. that work. and then when like, you're like, oh, I can't believe we worked four months for just three days. It was worth it. We're going to be friends forever. I'm not um, exactly going to say. I was just having that conversation. It's all promised. And then the next show, it's on a new thing. Or, you, you know, you have your theater relationship and the romance fizzles out. Literally yeah. closing out. <laughs> Literally closing your eyes, like it's not you, it's me. It's just, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll see you around. Are you auditioning for cats? You know, <laughs> best friends forever. <laughs> best friends forever. And I'll always have the bracelet you get. Oh my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have seen on your social media some of the model quality side to you. Um, I love your mermaid photo shoot. And Mr. Harvey, we have uh, seen some booty, some booty thirst trap pics. I was like, look at that booty on that kid. Um, <laughs> which brings me, what, what is love and dating looking like right now? Well, not right now because of COVID, but, you know, the whole fervor of what we do in the shadows and then getting cast in all of these different projects. You literally have been everywhere and have been so busy. Um, and when you're not doing that, you know, you're, you're raising awareness for so many different causes. Where does love and dating fit into all of this? I mean, at the moment it doesn't just because COVID and also I'm okay with that. Uh, and also I got out of a relationship uh, last year that was uh, over two years and, and it was fine. I think it, it was like the perfect time to like, you know, be on my yeah. own. And so when, you know, the relationship ended, I was just like, this is kind of perfect. And I kind of went, you know, on a self journey of like, I don't need anyone to be by my side, you know, at this moment. I really, I've, I'm, I've always been self-sufficient. I'm a romantic at heart, but I also know when work gets really heavy, it, I I put work before anything. And so there's no reason you to be in a relationship to. when someone, and it's not fair to them, you know, because if I wasn't in a relationship right now, it, I'd be the worst partner. I been, I've been out of town. I'm only going to go home for Christmas. And then I fly out of town again for another four months. So I'm not home. Like there'd be no point to be in a relationship with someone. It's not fair to them. And it's not fair to me because then you're trying to balance everything on top of work. And you're trying to do phone calls at four in the morning when you get home from being on set 16 hours and there it's 1 a.m. in LA, but it's 4 a.m in Toronto and you're and that's that routine can get really grueling and also you have all this pressure on you already for work and trying to just keep you know your your best focus and and health you know just in line and the last thing you need is like trying to worry about someone and and feeling that you're neglecting them you know so it's not fair to yeah. anyone to be in a relationship when it's like that especially when it when it's going with work like it is right now I'm so busy that literally I it's only when you have a moment to like breathe that you're like, oh yeah, I'm not in a relationship, you know, because if you're, yeah. if you're busy, you don't realize that it's like, people are always like, oh, well, you need someone. Don't you want to be with someone? It's like, no, when the time is right, you'll know and you'll feel That's it. Exactly right. But for the time being, I'm, I'm living. <laughs> <laughs> you go, girl. Okay. Uh, do you want to play a, a little rapid fire with us? Okay. 
Okay. Now that you are a recognized actor with a busy schedule, what is your most diva-like behavior or something that you demand now that is so much different than when you were first taking classes in Southern California? Do you have like behavior? I mean, I don't know if I, how, like, I mean, I got, I got, I didn't know that we get uh, first class uh, seating when we fly for business, like business seating or first class for projects. I didn't know that until like my first thing that I had to leave the state. And I was like, I thought it was a mistake. Like I was like, cause I'm, I own this obviously <laughs> food economy. And so when I got first, like that experience and they're like, oh, you can go to the first class lounge. And I was like, the what? And I was like, I didn't know the buildings upstairs in the LAX had rooms. Like it was just like, there's like a whole buffet in here and like drinks. And the <laughs> the drinks is where they get me. Yeah. Well, it was like, but then like the, everything's like included. So, and then, I would go to the bar. And I was like, how 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 much is it for the margarita? And they were like, oh no, it's included because you're first class now. And it's just like I'm first class now. <laughs> So for me, that that one would be like a, and mind you, I only, whenever I travel for work, it's like the best thing ever that you can do business. But I was like, I'm not paying for fucking business on my own if I don't have to. Like, it's like, that's expensive. So that, when I know that a project's happening and they're trying not to fly business, I think I've gotten used to it now. I'd be like, no, we have to get business. We have to get business class. Yeah, like, yeah I can't you have to jump in last. <laughs> uh, worst Halloween costume you've ever worn? Where's Halloween costume? Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm really proud of my costumes. Like, I mean, like the the hard, the worst one would probably be like maybe when I was like little and I tried to go as a mummy and I used like ace band aids around my yep. but they were like different and also I wore like this cloth so people were like are are you ghost and I was just like no <laughs> clearly I'm a mummy and they were like you are and I was like yes and Duh. I think escalated because then I was like maybe it's not gruesome enough so I'll, I'll add blood so then it was like wrapped in ace bandages with blood and they're like oh are you like a burn victim or are you like, no I'm a mummy Brendan <laughs> <laughs> uh, what sitcom from past or present would you cast you and your co-stars from shadows in oh my gosh uh geez that's a tough one I mean, maybe like Will and Grace, like, <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah we could probably use everyone in that show, um, but we have only one female, so someone would have to be gender bender or drag. That'd be fun. That'd yeah, be fun. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so you are going to produce and star in a scary movie about your love life. What is it called? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. What is it called? It's a horror movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It would be called Red Flags. <laughs> <laughs> I I love that. Uh, what is a musical theater role that you would cast yourself in once Broadway reopens? Oh, um, as a revival or like, is it like a, a current movie? Anything. You, you, it could oh. be new. It could be revival. It could be filling oh. in. It could be anything. I mean, that's a tough one, right? Uh, let's see. I mean, I would want to do like something fun, like hairspray, and like li like yeah. literally maybe do like a gender bender, and I could be Tracy, or I could do uh, you know Edna. I would be fun it's to too do. Too young. Edna. Well, but we know you. You can play any age now. <laughs> apparently, according to your IMDb, <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I do like a gender bender Tracy channel, which actually I went for Halloween a couple years ago uh, when I was filming with uh, Nikki Blonsky, who did the film. Yeah. Uh, I went as her version of uh, Tracy Turnblad. So there's somewhere in the internet you can look up um, Tracy Turnblad for Halloween somewhere. And I did a pretty good job, I have to say. I can imagine. Girl, wake <laughs> up, Baltimore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, uh, where where uh, do you want everybody to find you, follow you, and where can we buy your sweater in time for Halloween? Yeah, buy the sweater. Go to imafoolishmortal.com and you can look it up as familiar sweater. So it's a familiar sweater and you look, there's little Guillermo's. Oh my God, skin. it's so cute. I cannot wait for mine to get here. It's so cute and it's an easy, uh, you know, and you're also going to be helping, you know, LGBTQ youth in need during COVID time. So it's a win-win. You can also follow me on Instagram. All the information is on my Instagram. So go, as you see, up above, up above Harvey Guillen right here. Yeah on Instagram and uh, and yeah, same thing on Twitter. So come say hi, you know, say what's up Kiki. 
<laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you that sweater is a boy or chick magnet, wh whichever, whatever oh, side you're on. Because people are like, oh, how cute. And then they want to like cuddle with you and snuggle up to you and go vampire hunting. It's very, it's a bonding experience. It's really soft. I really like it. And it's really nice. So I, I'm really pleased with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, this has been Harvey Guillen from the Emmy nominated binge worthy show, What We Do in the Shadows. You can read my in depth interview with him in our October, November issue of Metrosource or metrosource.com, uh, but it's national, it's on newsstands, and in it we talk about Harvey's real life brush with the scariness um, <laughs> just in time for Halloween. And that has been our episode. I'm your host and lead writer for Metrosource, Alexander Rodriguez. You can follow me on Instagram at Alexander is on air. Until next time, stay true and do you, boo! Bloop! <laughs>